Hey everybody, Wyatt Paints here, and today is going to be the first in a series of videos where I help you go from STL file to a successfully 3D printed resin model. Today we're going to start with our settings, because without good settings, you can't get a good print. Let's get started. Okay, since I use an LGU printer, they run off a Chi2 box, so this guy will focus on that slicer. But these settings should apply to Prusa and Lychee slicer, even though they might be named slightly different. First, be sure to load a profile that corresponds with your printer. Chi2 box comes with profiles for most large brand printers, so this should be fairly easy. If you don't see your printer, you can manually enter your specs here. The resin setting is, is just for estimating your resin cost when printing, which might be important if you're running a business, but in my case, since I I use so many different resins, it's rarely accurate. The settings here will not affect your print. Now on to print settings, where adjustments made here can have drastic effects on your print. It starts with layer height. This refers to how thick each layer will be when printing. I use a 0.05 as it's pretty standard and works well with both miniatures and large models. While you can lower this to a 0.01, if you did, it would increase your print time by a factor of 5. Next is bottom layer count. This is a definition setting that will determine how many layers starting from the first will be considered bottom layers. As we move on to other settings, anytime it refers to bottom layers, it will only affect these layers. I find that 8 is a good amount as it covers my raft and the first few layers of my support. This ensures that both are well cured and have good adhesion to each other. Next is exposure time or normal layer exposure time. This is how long the UV light is exposed to resin for each normal layer. Since I use a variety of different resins, I find having a slightly higher than average exposure gives me a safety net even when I'm using a cheaper resin. If you only use one type of resin regularly, you'll want to run exposure tests to dial in your exposure setting. Look for that in a later video. Next is bottom exposure time. This is the same as above, but it will only be applied to the layers that we defined as the bottom layers. The usual rule of thumb here is that these exposure times should be 10 times your normal exposure time. So for me, that's 35 seconds. This is important as the extra time Time allows the resin to more fully cure and give a strong hold to the build plate. If it is not long enough, you will have parts that completely detach from your build plate and stick to the fab. Next is transition layer count. This defines the layers that happen after the bottom layer but before the normal layers. A good setting for this is 10. The next two settings are transition type and transition time decrement. One of these only has one setting and the other is determined by your transition layer count. What this controls is how the printer lowers the exposure time from the 35 seconds on the bottom layers to the 3.5 seconds of the normal layer. This needs to be done gradually so that each layer adheres to the previous. Next, we have waiting mode during printing. This can be a light off delay or a resting time. I use resting time, but I'll describe a light off delay briefly. Light off delay is basically an internal timer for every layer that tells the printer that the UV light cannot turn on until that timer is finished. It was an early way for hobbyists to control the light during printing and in my opinion, it was very clunky and different manufacturers handled it differently, so it was kind of a mess. I tend to avoid it. Resting time is a much more precise way of doing this, where you tell the printer to make a pause at a particular point in the printing cycle. The reason this is used is to give the resin time to stop moving before the UV light comes on. Every time the build plate moves up or down, the printed part moves through the resin and disturbs it, causing motion. And motion in a liquid, even one as thick as resin, causes waves that take time to stop. If the resin is still moving when the light comes on to cure it, it'll cause this blooming fuzzy surface effect on your printed part, or worse, a lack of layer adhesion to the previous layer, giving you layer separation. Both can lead to print failures which you want to avoid. Here you can see I added a half second rest period to each layer after the retract, which is when the build plate has moved back down into the resin to create the next layer. That half second is usually more than enough time for the resin to stop moving. If you're using a particular thin resin, you may have to increase this time. While yes, this delay will make your prints take longer overall, I always say there's no bigger save than doing it right the first time. Now we move over to the bottom lift distance and lift distance. Again, bottom just means that setting will only affect the layers we set as the bottom layers. In this case, the first eight. This distance is how far the build plate will rise from the FEP 
after each exposure. This is to separate the part from the FEP sheet at the bottom of the resin vat. Since the FEP is made of plastic, it has a bit of flex and stretch before it peels away. I run it a little bit higher than usual at 8 millimeters for two reasons. One, when I install a new FEP sheet, I won't be able to install it as tight as they do at the factory. So by default, it's going to have a bit more stretch than normal. And second, as the FEP ages, it'll get more flexible and bend and stretch further than when it was new. 8 millimeters gives me a bit more wiggle room with each of these and extends the productive life of my FEP sheet, saving me money. The retract distance is how far the build plate lowers after each lift. These are automatically the same as the lift distance. These should not be manually adjusted unless you really know what you're doing. Moving on to lifting and retract speeds. Here's where a lot of personal preference comes in. You can search online for room settings that will tell you to crank these up to 210 millimeters or higher. While my speed differs from the stock settings, I would not go that high as the more speed you use, the more motion you cause in the resin, which can cause failures I mentioned before. I stick to 150 millimeters for both lift and retract, and it gives me a nice balance of speed and reliability. For the last tab, first we have anti-aliasing, which aids in making smooth curves. Since the pixels on our LCD are rectangles, this setting allows you to semi-expose extra pixels to soften the edge and create smoother curves. Grade level determines the relative exposure of those extra pixels. For me, 3 gives a good result of smooth curves without excess feathering. Image blur refers to how many pixels are used for this effect past the edge of the model. I have found going higher than 2 results in semi-cured resin floating around in your vat, which should be avoided. Before I move on to the support settings, I'd like to take this moment to thank my very first Patreon supporter, The Macho. Thank you for joining the Painting Pantheon. Hopefully, you'll be joined by other good companies soon. If you'd like to help support this channel by keeping the lights on, you can find links in the description below. On to the support settings. While in this video I'll be going over all my settings and what they do, I will save how to effectively support a model for its own video. The first setting is the Z-Lift height. This is the default height your model will be lifted from the build plate to make room for the supports. 5 millimeters is the default and I haven't found a reason to change this. The next is the support type selector, which lists light, medium, and heavy. The parameters for each type of support are set individually, so keep that in mind if you want to copy my settings. I'll be going over what each setting does, but only going into depth for a few. Now along with each type of support, each is further broken down into three parts. The top, which is how the support connects to the part you're printing. The middle, which is the vertical beam that makes up the main body of the support. And the bottom, which is how the support connects to your build plate or raft. Just like with the support type, clicking on each part allows you to change the settings of that particular part of that support type. The final option here is the raft, which is not really a support, but more of a scaffolding that the supports can build from. I always use a raft because a large footprint that the raft gives you ensures that your parts do not detach from the build plate. If you only use individual skates on the supports, a few can detach and will cause print errors such as warping, or worse, an outright print failure. The settings for raft are shape, which there's only one, area ratio, this is the ratio compared to the area of the largest cross section of your model you're trying to support. You want a raft that's larger than your model, or you run the risk of the raft coming detached from the build plate. A ratio of 120% is good here. Thickness is how thick the raft will be. I use a 0.3 thickness because along with using a 0.05 layer height and eight bottom layers, those eight layers will make up the entirety of my raft and the first few layers of my supports. Giving all of these layers a 35 second exposure ensures that I have a good foundation and a solid hold on the build plate. Raft height refers to the height of the lip of the raft. Slope is the angle of that lip in relation to the build plate. Lowering this angle will make it easier for you to get a spatula in and remove the raft from the build plate, but it also increases the chance the raft will peel from the build plate as those first few layers will be larger in area than the previous layers. I leave this at 90 degrees. Since the raft height is only at 0.3, it'll be quite flexible and easy to remove. If you do have trouble removing a raft, consider getting a flex plate as it helps a ton. Now let's get into support settings. To make it easy on you, I will cycle through my top, middle, and bottom settings for each support type so you can pause the video and copy them down for yourself.
Now let's go over what each setting means. Starting with the top, we have connect shape, which is how the tip of the support connects to your part. I use a sphere as when you remove the support, you'll be left with a tiny little nub of resin on your part that you can easily sand off or remove with a hobby knife. If you don't use a sphere, you run the risk of when you remove the support that it could easily tear a chunk of your model with it, which will either need extensive sanding or the use of fillers to fix the surface. Next is contact diameter. This is how thick that connection is. The thicker it is, the stronger stronger the hold, followed by contact depth. This is how far the tip of the support is extending into your part. This one's not too important as when you remove your support, that tip just becomes a part of the model. Next is connection shape. This is a personal preference. I like cone. Next, upper and lower diameter. This is how thick the cone is at its widest part and narrowest part. Lastly is the connection length, which is how long the cone actually is. Clicking over to middle, we have shape diameter followed by angle, which is the minimum angle it connects to the cone at the top. This should be set to less than 90 degrees. At 90 degrees, you will not get adequate support and run the risk of the support failing by breaking at this joint. Pillar shape and diameter are pretty self-explanatory as these refer to the middle pillar that makes up the main body of the support. The upper and lower depth describes how deep the middle pillar connects to the top and bottom portion. Finally on the bottom, we have platform touch shape, which would be how the support connects to the build plate, but we're using a raft, so we can ignore that along with the touch diameter. The thickness is how thick that connection to the raft will be. The next section is for when a support anchors into another part of the model instead of the build plate, like when supports are used on the inside of a hollow part. These are similar to the settings for the top portion until you reach the contact points. Here you can have it have multiple contact points forming a sort of root system. Personally, I have never needed more than a single contact point. The last bit of settings is for auto supports which will be useful for giving you a head start on supports without having to place each one yourself. The first setting gives you the maximum distance that Chitu box will add a strut connecting two nearby supports followed by start height, which is how far from the build plate these struts can start. Density is hands down the most important setting as it determines how many supports are placed automatically on the model. Setting it to 100 will fill every available space that needs support with a support, which will use a ton of resin and make it a pain to remove. I find using 21% to be the sweet spot. From there, you may only need a support here and there to finish the job. If you've made it this far in this very long video, I gotta say well done. You should have a pretty good grasp on what each setting does and be ready for my next video that'll go over orientating, hollowing, adding drain holes, and finally supporting a model for print. Look forward to it soon. If you did learn something today, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button so you can catch the next one. And as always, thank you for watching and I'll catch you next time.